Wednesdays 6.30 p.m. to 7 and Saturdays 12.30 p.m. to 1 p.m. in the afternoon. And I'd like to thank you for joining me today. Today I'd like to talk to you on a continued basis of my book, What If You Knew How Much God Loves You? And that book is available on Barnes & Nobles as well as Amazon, uh, Kindle, and also I'll be creating another website soon that you'll be able to get all of my religious books on. Okay, so watch for the YouTube channel, which is sblack3001, and you can check the YouTube channel for any updates on, on additional websites. And uh, my name is Dr. Sylvia Black, and I'm the author of this book. And today we're coming to you from chapter 14, which talks about the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which illuminate in love. Okay. Uh, and today's fruit we're going to be talking about is the fruits of long suffering. The fruits of long suffering. And thank you for joining me today. Okay. Now, the fruits of long suffering. What is the meaning of long suffering? Well, I'm so glad you asked. It means to patiently endure wrongs and our difficulties, to have the power to withstand hardships and or stress, to endure trying circumstances with an even temper and to patiently endure pain and all hardships. Now a lot of us have to go through long suffering. A lot of us have endured it, are enduring it, and will endure uh, hardships, stress. Okay, but the key here is the word patient, to patiently endure. Okay, the wrongs and the difficulties that are done to you. And to have the power to withstand it, the stress that's going to come upon you the trying circumstances. And it's not by our power, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit and God himself that gives us the ability to be able to withstand the wiles of the devil and to endure long suffering. Now I'm gonna go into detail about long suffering here. This may be a part two and I'll let you know towards the end of this broadcast. Now as a believer, we will go through many difficulties and hardships and stress related to situations and circumstances as a test. The Bible says that I allowed you to go through the wilderness these some 40 years to humble thee, to test thee, to see if you would serve me or not, you know, the Lord. Uh, now, would you want to change places with Jesus on the cross? Have nails hammered into your hands and feet and hang from a cross allowing your body's weight, okay, to kill you by asphyxiation? That means that your lungs slowly close and that you're trying to breathe and you can't breathe and all of a sudden no air comes in and you just exasperate right there on the cross from your own body's weight. The one who knew no sin, yet he's paying the price for us all. Would you rather take places with him? Okay, in your long suffering. Okay, now we as Christians, why isn't this working? Okay, we as Christians are also required to endure long suffering, to withstand temptation, the same test and temptation that Jesus endured on the mountaintop when the devil came to tempt him, remember? Now, can you imagine the conversation between the devil and Jesus other than what's written in the Bible? The devil could, could not make Jesus conform to his ways. He could not, and of course, we already knew that he wasn't going to do it. But the devil figured that he was going to try it anyway. And I'm sure the devil probably knew. But he figured that if he could show him. And I, I know it was it had to have been a mirage. A mirage is something you see, but it's not really there. Okay, so it had to have been a mirage that the devil was showing God 
or maybe he was showing him something that wasn't even didn't even belong to him and trying to get Jesus tempting him to go his way. Now the devil could not trick Jesus into it. The devil had to ask Jesus in order to get permission. Okay, the same way it is with you and me. Satan has to get our permission as well as God's permission to tempt us, test us, okay, and to try us. Now some people do not think that uh, they are worthy of anything other than what life has to offer or what life brings your way instead of what God's Word has to offer. So you think that the only thing that you, you're entitled to is what's happening to you, the suffering that you're enduring, which was the case with me. I didn't really believe it. See, I never really gave the devil credit, you know, but when you're suffering, you're going to go through the emotions of the suffering, you know. You're going to cry. You're going to be angry. You're going to be sad. You're going to be you have a whole lot of different kind of emotions. You know, you may even want to hurt somebody, get back at them, and then you end up might having to do that to get them off your back, you know. Uh, depends on what type of suffering you're enduring. If it's an extreme case, then you might even have to get some medical attention. Uh, but physical suffering is one thing, but then when you go through emotional suffering, a lot of times the psychiatrist and the psychotherapist and what have you, and the physiotherapist, they give you medication to uh, sort of numb the pain. Uh, and then they give you counseling and they talk to you and blah, 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 and they may even give you shock treatment. But, but that's to dull the pain. It's not necessarily to, uh, to alleviate it. Like you go to a hospital for physical pain, they know what's wrong. They can tell, they can diagnose it, they can examine you, test you, give you operation, what have you, to try their best to fix the problem, but they can work towards fixing it. Okay, because it's more evident when it's on the outside, when you're when it's in the flesh. But when you're dealing with emotional kind of suffering, it's not always easy to detect. And even the person that's going through the suffering doesn't always know. That's why sometimes when you talk to someone about your problem, they can sort of, you know, based on their knowledge and experience and their training, they can help you through the problem. And most of the time it does work, but it's harder to detect. And a lot of times, like I said, medication is definitely necessary. Sort of like in the case with Lazarus when he was dealing with his suffering. He was being tormented by so many demons, it was pathetic. And he was wilding out all of the time, you know, he was just going crazy. So the people of the city, they changed him to the cemetery, and that's where he slept at night. The cemetery was Lazarus' home, okay? And he was possessed by the devil, yet he still had some por portion of, of his uh, sane mind. And the reason why I say that is because when he encountered Jesus, he addressed him with respect. Lazarus addressed Jesus with respect when Jesus approached Lazarus. And so therefore he had some semblance of sanity, you know, even though he was being possessed by the devil. And I believe it, that's what happens with you and I. When it happened with me, I wasn't completely, like, I totally blacked out. I suffered from a lot of emotional and physical, you know, uh, suffering at the hand of one particular individual who incorporated other individuals who got them on the bandwagon. Okay, and so, uh, you know, that was the case with me. So it was a little harder to detect with the long suffering, but I had endured it with patience and um, I had endured the long suffering with patience and uh, had the, God gave me the power to withstand the hardship and the stress. Now, saying that I didn't go through the physical complications of the, of the suffering, but I did. But guess what? I'm still here. Okay? Now, can you imagine, like I said, the conversation between Jesus and uh, Lazarus, I mean, and, uh, and, and the devil? Okay, he deviled, uh, Jesus is on the mountaintop, and he knew he was down there. Jesus knows everything. He knew that the devil was going to come to him and say, and try to tempt him. That's the reason why he, why he went up there in the first place. You know, he didn't have to. He go on the mountaintop to, to to view the city down below. And he, I believe he was going just to check the place out to see what was going on, how bad they were sinning. You know, how far, how much of a job did he need to do before he, he was crucified on the cross? Because that was the ultimate price that he had to pay. That's his job that Jesus had to be crucified on the cross. He had to accomplish that task in order to fulfill his mission, what he came to earth for. 
Now, some people do not think that they are worthy of anything. Like I said, of all of them, you know, what you deal with. A lot of people don't think that they have, you know, that you, you know, when people mistreat you all the time, or they treat you better, they talk against you, sometimes you start to become self-conscious and you think that it has something to do with you. Like a couple, for example, a man and a, and a wife, or even just a, you know, a girl and a guy who are dealing with each other, whether you're married or not, and then he doesn't treat her right, let's say, for example, and she thinks that it's something that she did wrong. And it's not always that way. It's his, ability, his inability to be able to love you the way he wants it, the way you want to be loved. Or his, his inability to correct if he's a cheater. You know, his inability to do something relating to the love that he's supposed to have for you or the way he's supposed to treat you in this relationship. Or maybe it's the lady. It's her inability to commit. Her inability to do. It's not always your fault. The reason why somebody else does what they do. Hurting people hurt people. Okay, but God's word is true and God's word never comes back void. It always accomplishes what it was sent out to do. Okay, it always goes forth and always comes back accomplished. When God makes a promise, he keeps it. We must wait on the Lord, however, and we must patiently endure the trials and tribulations that come our way. God's strength helps us to do that, okay? He gives us strength uh, to run this race and endure the battles all the way through. Uh, doesn't mean that the suffering is going to be enjoyable. And never comes back void. God's word always accomplishes what it was set out to do. When God makes a promise, he keeps it. We must wait on the Lord, however, and we must patiently endure the trials and tribulations that come our way. God's strength helps us to do that. He gives us the strength to run this race and endure the battles all the way through. Okay, it's his strength that allows us the ability to be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. It doesn't mean that the, uh, the suffering is going to be enjoyable. It doesn't mean that the maltreatment from the enemy is something that you're going to like or even get used to. Uh, you're going to become angry or sad, and you're going to, you know, you're going to feel some type of an emotion there um, because of the way you're being treated. You may even feel like you want to hurt somebody because you want to just stop the pain. Okay, um, but strength and endurance comes when you can remain even-tempered throughout. Doesn't mean that you're not going to feel what you feel, or maybe even act out a while out, you know, uh, or think uh, what you want to think. You're still human, and you know you're going to cry sometime. That's definite, okay? You're going to definitely cry sometime, okay? Uh, now people can be cruel, hurting people, hurt people. Like I said before, that's why. We have a God to talk to. Sometimes he's the forefront of our life, and other times he's the only one that we can go to. Now, suffering for doing good, 1 Peter 3, 13, 18, the Living Translation, reads, Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you are suffering, even if you suffer for doing what's right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respective way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see uh, what a good life, uh, wait, when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ, remember it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. And I'll explain that a little later in this particular segment. Christ suffered for our sins once and for all, okay? Uh, he never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. I made a lot of the blessings to the reading here and doing. 
of His mighty power upon the magnanimous word. The challenge in the, your suffering is to endure the suffering without sinning. Now, you know, that may be may or may not be easy for a lot of us, you know, depending on the type of suffering that you're doing. Because we always feel that we need an outlet. That's why I'm talking about it, but what if you knew how much God loves you? If you knew how much God really loved you, then you'd be able to endure the long suffering. You'd be able to do it with the patience and without sinning and with all the qualities that God is looking for. Of course, it may not be easy the first time around. The first time, you know, it's going to come as a shock unless you're prepared for it in some kind of way. You have to be prepared for these, you know, because we already know that the devil goes to and fro to see who you're going to be devoured. But we, I always approach a situation with an open mind, trying to give people more credit than they're worth, you know. And it turns out that they a lot of times they disappoint me in a great uh, and mighty way. And, and a lot of times it comes as a shock. And then I have to cry about it. I have to let out some tears. That's one of my outlets, you know. And then, but realizing that God really loves us, you know, the way he really does. I mean, his love is infinite. It's, I mean, when you think about it, you know, if you had a person, one person in your life, that you say, wow, he really loves me, you know, or well, she really loves me. She, you know, she's there for me all the time. I can count on her. I can depend on her. You know, that what they do for you is not always a meaning of their love, you know, but it could be. It's an expression. But it's not, it's not always the reason why they live. It's just like when somebody hurts you, you know, makes you suffer, you know, and they say that they hate me. They do doing this to me because they hate me. That's not always true. They may be doing it to you for another reason, but yes, they do hate you. And why do they do that? Because the world hates us, because we're not of the world. If we were of the world, the world would love its own. But since we are Christ, you know, you see, they're going to hate you even more, you know. But knowing that God loves us, you know, he's there to protect us. He's there to watch over us. What if you know how much God really, really loved you in your heart? That you know you got somebody that you can count on who has all power in his hands, right in the palm of his hands. In his hands, and when you feel like, oh, God really loves me. I know he's going to protect me. I know he's going to protect me. He's going to watch over me. Because look what happened already. He's been keeping you. He's been watching over you already. He's already been protecting you. And there may have been things that came against you you didn't even, wasn't even prepared for. You didn't even know what was going to happen. And here you are still here to talk about it. You see what I'm saying? But remember that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And that you're more than a conqueror. And the greater he is he that lives within you than he that lives within the world. Okay? If God before you, he's more than the world against you. Okay? And God's love gives us an opportunity to repent for our sins, okay, and turn from our sins. You know, you how you know how a person does wrong, even the one that's causing the suffering. God still loves that person, you know, just as much as He loves us. But is uh, is that person going to be blessed like a child of God? You know, that's another question, and I doubt it. You see what I'm saying? That's just like if a person uh, causes suffering on other people all their life, and then they are right there on their dying bed, and then they repent. You mean you're going to have an opportunity to go to heaven and I had to live my life right all my life and suffer and you're going to do wrong all your life and suffer and you think you're going to go to heaven? Well, of course, God makes a decision, but in my opinion and what the Bible has to say, I say no. You know, that's not going to happen because ain't no way, you know, our actions, you know, you know, is part of us getting whether you're going to get into heaven or not, but we get it by faith, okay, and by the grace of God, okay? Now, that's why, okay, God, <clears throat> excuse me, that's why God sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish but have eternal and everlasting life. Okay, and that's you and that's me. Okay, God is very lenient in His punishment. It's not meant to hurt us, but it's meant to make us stronger in Him and build a long lasting relationship with Him. That's one of the reasons why He created us. It's for a family. He wants a family just like He wants, you know, we want a family. You know, he says in the Bible, it says if we can't, if he can't get us to cry out and worship, who's going to get the rocks to do it in our place? Well, I don't need no rock crying out in my place, but to show you somebody's going to worship him, somebody's going to praise him, he's going to get somebody, but he wants us. That's why he created us in his image and likeness. When I look at you, I'm supposed to be seeing Jesus. When you look at me, you're supposed to be seeing an image of Jesus, what he looks like. We all look alike. You know, and you'd be surprised that he looks very much like us. Somebody said it was a joke. I'm, I'm going to revise the joke a little bit. It's about uh, these uh, three men. They were talking. They couldn't figure out what race Jesus was. 
okay, well, he, you know, one picture depicts him as a white man and another picture depicts him as an African-American, you know. But it does say in the Bible that he has woolly hair, okay, and that he, you know, his skin was fair, I believe, or dark, because he was always out in the sun and he walked everywhere he went, you know. And some people say a white man ain't going to be walking the way they're going to take a cab or back then you get on a horse or a camel or something. You know, but they, you know, these three men, they couldn't figure out what race God was. Uh, so they finally died and went to heaven and whatnot. And they, they said, now we're going to find out what, 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 you know, what, he, what race he is. You know, I show him his you know, I have a picture of him as a black man and he has a picture of him as a white man. So then all of a sudden, here comes Jesus, you hear his footsteps walking out from around the corner of heaven. And then he comes around the corner and whatnot and he walks up to them and they're shocked, they can't say nothing. And everything, and all of a sudden, there he's up there, right face to face with him. And he says, Yo, man, what's up, girls and guys? How you doing now, mom? Yeah, man. <laughs> That's the way I see him. I see Jesus as a black man. You know, I look at him because the Bible says he has woolly hair. And ain't no white man got no woolly hair, okay? Um, but back to business now. <laughs> The future of glory, Romans 8, 18 to 30 reads thusly, Yet what we suffer with now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For well, all creation is waiting eagerly for that glory, for that future day, when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation uh, was selected to God's curse. But the eager, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. But we know that all creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present day, time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our fill, our full rights as his adopted children. Including our new bodies he has promised us, we were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't have, that we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. Some people refer to it as speaking in tongues. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit leads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Okay. Uh, for God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him and having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. Instead of complaining about what the enemy did to you. Okay, I may the Lord add a blessing to the reading you're doing of his mighty, powerful, and magnanimous word. Now, instead of complaining about what the enemy did to you, to pray, we need to forgive him. Okay, if I can press it out, I like to say, Father, forgive them because they know not what they do. I don't suggest that you do it in their face because that seems to give them permission to do it again. Or oh, you won't forgive me? See, they don't have the understanding of what forgiveness really means. You know, I spoke a message uh, about my book that I said forgiveness is one of the highest and greatest acts of love. Okay, now we need, also need to trust in God that He knows what He is doing and that uh, the latter, your latter days will be greater than your former days. Okay, be tolerant of those who are not as gracious as our God, and do not judge or look down on them. Establish patience by asking God to help you in this area, and be selfless in your giving. But the main thing I say is come out from among them and with a quickness. 
In other words, run for your life or run for the hills. Okay? Now, just because you forgive someone doesn't mean you have to hang out with them, okay? The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate but equal. But if you have to forgive people more than once, then they are not the person that you need to be hanging out with. Okay, you need to hang out with people who are going to bring you up and not bring you down. The people in your life who are going to bring you up, not bring you down, but the people in your life should love the Lord more than they love themselves. The love of the Lord helps you, okay? The love of the Lord helps you to love others. They should strive to be more like Him just as you do. The love uh, that you have in your heart for yourself should uh, also be in the people you hang out with. Okay, um, okay, and with the people who hang out with you. They should love themselves, others, and God. Anybody who, who loves themselves more than they love you is going to move you away from your salvation. Okay, 1 Peter 2, 18 to 25, New Living Translation says, I'm going to conclude with this. Uh, you who are slaves must accept the authority of your masters with all respect. <clears throat> Do what they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. For God is pleased with you when you do what you know is right and patiently endure unfair treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. Okay, but if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For well, God called you to do good, even if that means suffering. You're just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor he deceived anyone. Never deceived anyone nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we could be dead to sin and live for what is right. Okay, by his wounds you were healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading you're doing. It was mighty powerful and magnanimous word. And we, today we've been talking about what if you knew how much God loves you? What if you knew how much God really loves you? You know, would that help you endure the suffering even more? Knowing that, you know, God's work is, well, not, is not finished in you. God is not through with us yet. He still has a great work in us. Your body may be perishing, but your spirit is being renewed. That means you ain't going nowhere, baby. You're going to live. Okay, and since the Bible doesn't say, yet he, you know, die, your flesh, yet he shall live. Okay, and I'm going to explain to you the different types of suffering that you endure that I found out when I researched the Bible. So this is going to be a part two, and I'm going to ask you to join me next week for the second part of uh, the fruits of long suffering that illuminate in love. And my name is Dr. Sylvia Black, and I'm the author of this book, and I'm the show. And I'd like to thank you for joining me today, and I'll see you next time.